Well, hey, and welcome back to Woven. I am so excited to introduce a new month for you. I hope you've been enjoying the spring in the New Testament as we've been learning about Phoebe and Lydia together and how her story can encourage our stories and in living into God's greater story better together. But as much as I have enjoyed being in the New Testament with you, we are headed back to the Old Testament. There's just so many amazing stories back there with so many women who love God and are just filled with the power of God to do what he would have us do. And so this month, I'm excited to announce that our Woven Woman of the Bible for the month of April is Hulda. Now, you may not have heard of Hulda. She is in 2 Kings chapter 22. You can also see her story in 2 Chronicles chapter 34. But we'll be in 2 Kings today, and I'm so excited to introduce you to her. So without further ado, I'm honestly just going to jump right in. I'll be reading from the New International Version. Again, feel free to read along with me or enjoy story time, as is our custom. I'll be in 2 Kings 22, and then we'll get to talk about it. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. His mother's name was Jedida, daughter of Adiah. She was from Bozkath. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed completely the ways of his father, David, not turning aside to the right or the left. In the 18th year of his reign, King Josiah sent the secretary, Shaphan, son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, to the temple of the Lord. He said, go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, and have him get ready the money that has been brought into the temple of the Lord, which the doorkeepers have collected from the people. Have them entrust it to the men appointed to supervise the work on the temple, and have these men pay the workers who repair the temple of the Lord, the carpenters, the builders, and the masons. Also have them purchase timber and dress stone to repair the temple. But they need not account for the money entrusted to them because they are honest in their dealings. Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. He gave it to Shaphan, who read it. Then Shaphan, the secretary, went to the king and reported to him. Your officials have paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord and have entrusted it to the workers and supervisors at the temple. Then Shaphan, the secretary, informed the king, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. And Shaphan read from it in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. He gave these orders to Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam son of Shaphan, Akbor son of Micaiah, Shaphan the secretary, and Asiah the king's attendant. Go and inquire of the Lord for me, and for the people, and for all Judah, about what is written in this book that has been found. Great is the Lord's anger that burns against us, because those who have gone before us have not obeyed the words of this book. They have not acted in accordance with all that is written there concerning us. Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam, Akbor, Shaphan, and Asiah went to speak to the prophet Holda, who was the wife of Shalem, son of Tikva, the son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe. She lived in Jerusalem in the new quarter. She said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Tell the man who sent you to me. This is what the Lord says. I am going to bring disaster on this place and its people, according to everything written in the book the king of Judah has read. Because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods and aroused my anger by all the idols their hands have made, my anger will burn against this place and will not be quenched. Tell the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says concerning the words you heard. Because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before the Lord, when you heard what I have spoken against this place and its people, they would become a curse and be laid waste. And because you tore your robes and wept in my presence, I also have heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, I will gather you to your ancestors, and you will be buried in peace. 
Your eyes will not see all the disaster I'm going to bring on this place. So they took her answer back to the king. Then the king called together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. He went up to the temple of the Lord with the people of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets, all the people from the least to the greatest. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the temple of the Lord. The king stood by the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord and keep his commands, statutes, and decrees with all his heart and all his soul, thus confirming the words of the covenant written in this book. Then all the people pledged themselves to the covenant. Okay, so we are meeting King Josiah, who actually became king at the age of eight years old. Pretty little. Josiah is known as the last and like the greatest, the most holy, the most righteous king of Judah before it falls. Josiah has inherited a mess of a kingdom because Josiah's great grandpa, Hezekiah, he was also a righteous king, but none is considered as righteous as Josiah up until now. We know that because in 2 Kings 23, 25, it says, neither before nor after Josiah was there a king like him, who turned to the Lord as he did, with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his strength, in accordance with all the law of Moses. So he has this righteousness in his heritage from his great-granddad, but after that, Manasseh and Amon have made a mess of things. They have turned from the God of Israel, the God of their ancestors. We know it's obvious because King Josiah, you know, in the 18th year of his reign, he's repairing the temple and the high priest finds the book of the law in the temple. In the temple, God's own word had to be found. Clearly, it wasn't used. Josiah had never heard it. How heartbreaking is that? And so they're repairing the temple and they find this book, the high priest does, and he gives it to Josiah's secretary, Shaphan. And Shaphan reads it, and he's like, okay, our king needs to read this. So he reads it out loud in the presence of King Josiah. And here's what I love. Josiah hears that word of God, which I'll tell you we now understand is probably the book of Deuteronomy, based on what we read here. It sounds a lot like Deuteronomy. And so Josiah hears these words of God from Deuteronomy for the first time, and he immediately repents. He tears his robes, he's remorseful, and he doesn't only repent for the fact that he has failed to hear and respond in obedience to these words of God himself, but he repents for those who've gone before him, for the sins of his ancestors that he has inherited. And he didn't even have a say in that, but at the presence of God and his word, he knows the right response is repentance on behalf of him, of those who've gone before him, and on behalf of all the people that he's responsible for as king. I think it's such a humble posture that Josiah takes, and so he repents, but he also then calls together his A-team, right? His cabinet, these five guys who aren't going to get a burger and fries, but they're going to seek after a prophet who can authenticate and confirm that this is God's word, who can further explain what Josiah had just heard. Now, what's interesting to know is that Jeremiah and Zephaniah were both prophets who were available and accessible at this time. We know Jeremiah and Zephaniah because they have whole books of the Bible dedicated to them. But Josiah doesn't seek after their guidance. He seeks after Huldah's. Isn't that interesting? Now, most of us don't know Huldah, which I think is really sad. She doesn't have a whole book of the Bible dedicated to her. But she was a prophet in the time of Jeremiah and Zephaniah just like them. So the king's A-team seeks after her. And it's interesting language that Josiah uses. If you see in verse 13, he says, Go and inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all of Judah about the words that he had heard. Go and inquire of the Lord. And where do they go? They go to Huldah. This is because this is before Jesus came. This is before he gave us the Holy Spirit. So the role of the prophet in this time was to speak for God to people. So people would encounter the prophet, and that prophet would tell them what God would have to say to them. So when you see Huldah, she says, this is what the Lord God says. 
She's speaking on behalf of God to the people as any prophet in that time would have done. It's really cool to see that connection, I think. And so he sends them and they go straight to Huldah. And what's interesting is that they don't feel the need to explain why they went to Huldah. They also don't go anywhere else to seek a second opinion. This is really refreshing to me and I think it might be bothersome to some. But the point is, it's not really a big deal that they go to Huldah. It's a big deal to us now. It wasn't a big deal then. I love that, that these brothers and sisters in Christ, well, Christ did not come yet, but these sons and daughters of God can serve God together equally, right? In right relationship, it was not a big deal. Another thing that's really cool to notice is that in that culture, it would have been appropriate for the king to summons Hulda before his presence, that she would have come to him. But Josiah doesn't do that. He sends his high court officials to her. By doing this, he is showing her honor. Why am I telling you this? Because remember, Josiah is known as the most righteous king in Judah. So what that means is that his behaviors are right behaviors in the kingdom of God. Look at what he does. Look at the care that he takes. Look at how he repents at the hearing of God's word. Look at how he wants to see that confirmed and authenticated. He sends out his A-team to a daughter of God, the prophet Hulda, to confirm and authenticate God's word. Here's what I love about what Hulda does. She is ready to be used by God exactly as he created her to. And she is unafraid and unashamed to speak God's word boldly, without flattery, even before the king and his men. She did not have easy words to say. She was pronouncing the judgment of God that they had just read. And isn't it interesting that Josiah heard that word and he knew that these are not only words to describe the past, but these are prophetic words for the present. And Holda simply says, that's right, right? Like your fears are true. This judgment is coming because not long after this, we're going to see that Judah falls and the Babylonian exile begins. That prophecy is correct. And what's wild to me is that they can't escape it. Like, it's a sure thing. It's coming. But coming out of this, what does Josiah do? He not only repents on behalf of himself and his people, but he, lead, he leads the whole nation in a great reformation, a time of collective repentance and reform before God, even though judgment is sure to come. Wow, I just can't hardly get to know very many kings and leaders like that in our day. You know what I'm saying? That like he didn't run away, he didn't try to shift the blame, like he took ownership of the abandoning of God, of himself, of his ancestors, and of his whole nation. And he led him in the right way of God. You wonder why he's called the most righteous king of Judah. But here's God's grace that I love on full display. In verse 19, it says, because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I have spoken against this place and its people, and because you tore your robes and wept in my presence, I also have heard you. Therefore, I'll gather you to your ancestors and you will be buried in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster I'm going to bring on this place. God is gracious to Josiah because he heard God, he believed God, and he responded in repentance and obedience, in honesty, weeping in the presence of God. You may have heard it said, the sacrifice that God desires is a broken and contrite heart. And we see that in Josiah. And God is gracious that even though this judgment is coming, he's saying, hey, you're going to die before that happens. You're going to die in peace. And I know that this maybe doesn't sit super well with us in this day, but it's still the story. And I still see the heart of God in this. That for generations, people had abandoned God. They had built their life on idols that they made with their own hands. The temple had been in terrible condition. The word of God had been lost in the dust. And yet, God draws his people to himself. That word of God is found. Josiah hears and repents. And he leads a reformation of the whole nation. 
But before he does, he consults Hulda. You see, what Hulda does here, honestly, is like getting the ball rolling for the whole process of canonization. And that's a big word. We have this whole Bible. It didn't just like come from heaven to earth in one bound, beautiful thing. It is these writings inspired by God through people of God across so many different places and cultures and time that has come together. And so while she may not be the first, she's the first that I know of, the first that's easily seen in scripture to confirm and authenticate God's word as God's word. Does that make sense? So like some eight centuries later, the canon is complete. But hold us one who really gets that ball rolling. And I just think that is so cool and special. And again, like most of us have no idea who Holda is. And one thing I want you to notice, that's kind of been the point of a lot of women we've talked about this spring, is a lot of us don't even know who these women are. And while that makes me sad, here's what I love about those women. I don't think that they're bugged that we don't know their name because they didn't live to make their name famous. They lived according to God's way and to lift his name high. But I love that as we share her story, we're getting to know God better. We're getting to know the heart of God better. Don't you think? Hold that. It wasn't a big deal that they sought her, not just opinion, but her calling. That God had chosen and called her to be a prophet, to speak for him on behalf of people that he supplied her with all the wisdom that she needed to authenticate his word and to boldly proclaim that on his behalf to the king of Judah. She was ready and willing to be used by God exactly as he created her to. She was unhindered and unashamed, but I think she was gracious too, just as God. We don't hear much else about Huldah, But we hear about her here. And speaking of that word here, what's really interesting to me is that when I planned that we were doing this, it was before the spring. When I saw God and I was like, God, who would you have us learn about this spring? And kind of ordering like, okay, it's going to be Phoebe and Lydia and Hulda, and you'll see who we're doing next month. But I did not know at that time what I was going to be assigned to preach in our sanctuary and chapel services just a few weeks ago. I was preaching on Jesus before the Sanhedrin in Luke 22, starting in verse 66. I encourage you to go back. But Jesus says to the Sanhedrin, if I tell you, you won't believe me. And if I ask, you won't answer. And I was so convicted hearing that word that it also was not just a word for the past, but a word for the present, much like Josiah felt, honestly, that Jesus is inviting us to listen and believe him and to hear and respond in obedience in a way that we simply haven't before. That I grieve that we have not heard him. How could we possibly obey him if we're not even listening? So when I'm reading this story of Huldah and Josiah, I can't help but notice the language of hearing. So I challenge you to go back this month in 2 Kings 22 and circle every time you find that word here, or hearing and see the significance. Quickly, I'll read for you. It says in 11, when the king heard the words of the book of the law. And you see it a lot when it says in 18, this is what the Lord God of Israel says concerning the words you heard because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I have spoken against this place. God says, I also have heard you. It goes both ways. We are to listen and hear God and believe and respond in obedience, but God also hears us. How kind that God would lean down to hear us no matter what. I love that there's example of Josiah weeping in the presence of God. God is delighted to hear that. Friends, I'm coming to you this morning out of a really difficult week, one of the hardest of my lives. My heart is simply shattered. I have done a whole lot of weeping in the presence of God, and I know that he is delighted to hear that, that he hears my cry. 
I know that the things that are grieving me, they grieve me because they grieve him too. How kind that God would bend down to listen and to grieve with us. Josiah is grieved because the heart of God is. That God's own people, for his own possession, have failed to follow him. They have turned away, disregarded his word, disregarded him and his voice, and disregarded the call he has for them. It grieves God's heart. One thing I wanted you to note, because I don't know, the translations are all different in English, but in verse 13, you see that Josiah's um, saying, Great is the Lord's anger that burns against us, because those who have gone before us have not obeyed the words of this book. That word obeyed in Hebrew also means listen. How cool is it that the same word in Hebrew means both listen and obey, one and the same. And my apologies if you were with me in the chapel or the sanctuary when I talked about how Jesus defines his family as those who hear God's word and obey it. It's his own words. It's the same word in Hebrew. Those who hear his word and obey it. Friends, do you hear him today? And if you do, will you obey him? Everything that God asks of us is for our good and for his glory. I mean that with my whole heart. He's not trying to rain on our parade. He knows what's best for us and he provides what's best for us. Sis, what do you need to hear from God today? What do you need to believe about God? What do you need to obey? No matter what. I pray that we would be able to encourage one another in our thread groups to hear what God's been trying to say to us and to respond in obedience, knowing that he's worthy of it all. I love that Josiah did not know that God was going to be gracious and allow him to die in peace before this judgment came. He didn't know that, but he knew that God needed to be obeyed and listened to. He knew that God was worthy of everything of repentance and reformation, not just for himself, but for his whole people. But did you notice it starts with him? It can be so easy for me to point fingers at culture today, to figure out why are things such a mess? But I'm a part of culture. Why is the church hurting so many people? I'm a part of the church. Reformation and repentance and revival and refining starts with me. And it's painful, but it's so worth it. And so as I'm in this journey, honestly, right now, of God refining me through fire, I invite you to join me. I encourage you to. It's so worth it. I'm coming to know him in a way I just simply haven't before, and I want nothing less than him and so much more of his righteousness. Josiah is known as the most righteous king in Judah. And look at the way that he responded to God. I think we have a lot to learn there from him. And then Hulda, I just love that we get to know her a little bit this month. Not much to say about her in scripture, but there is something. And I think her story deserves to be told. So I pray that today you're encouraged. That God called, equipped, and chose Hulda to be used according to his purposes to help bring about a reformation in an entire nation. God is still calling, equipping, and choosing his sons and daughters in this generation. What might he have you do, hand in hand with him, for his glory and our good? Will you pray with me? God, I thank you for who you are. God, I thank you that you created us to hear you. I thank you that your word of life is unlike anybody else's. Jesus, I think about how you were in the boat with the disciples in the storm, 
And what was it that calmed the wind and the waves, that pressed up against that boat and also would rise up within them? It was the sound of your voice. Nothing more and nothing less. And I am encouraged by that right now as I'm experiencing my own storm and the wind and the waves are pressing up against me and rising within me, I fix my eyes on you, Jesus. I seek to hear your voice because it's only your voice who calms the storm outside and within me. And I find your voice in your word of truth. I find your voice in community with others who are listening for you too, who are following you too. And so God, I thank you for these thread groups. I pray they are just that for every woman in the group to be able to hear you, God, so clearly. And God, to have encouragement and accountability to respond to your word in belief and obedience. God, I know your character. You are not gonna ask us to do something that you will not equip us to do. So fear has no place here. There's no such thing as risk when we're following you. Those things rise up in us when we take our eyes off of you. And so Lord Jesus, let us learn to be like Josiah and like Holda, where we fix our eyes on you and that's more than enough. Jesus, remind us why we're even here and what life is about. I confess that I have built my life on idols that I've made with my own hands, and I'm sorry, and I repent of that, and I thank you for your forgiveness. I wanna build my life on your word, on your promises, and in your presence. I thank you that I can come boldly before your presence to receive mercy when I need it most because of Jesus. And I pray that over my sisters today. May we come before you even now in the context of this beautiful family. And may we be marked as those who hear your word and obey it. Amen.